Welcome to my Politics of Nuclear Nonproliferation podcast. Uh, the topic for today is the role of the United States in the existing nonproliferation regime and what would happen to this regime if the U.S. were to genuinely commit itself to complete nuclear disarmament. Um, for this podcast, I'm lucky enough to be interviewing Dr. William Walker from the University of St. Andrews, a Politics of Nuclear Nonproliferation expert uh, at, at, at St. Andrews. And um, this is for my solo portion. And uh, Throughout my interview with Dr. Walker, I hope to explore how the existing non-proliferation regime would be impacted if the United States were to genuinely commit itself to complete nuclear disarmament. Um, I'd also like to get a background on, you know, the presence of the United States in the nuclear non-proliferation regime and um, how the United States has exercised its outsized influence on this regime throughout the throughout its existence, uh, given their outsized responsibility for nuclear proliferation, being the nation that started this um, started this new age of, of, of military weapons technology. Um, you know, while, while the scenario that I'm hoping to explore is completely hypothetical, some questions will center on, you know, recent works in the field of non-proliferation and, um, you know, some of Dr. Walker's specific works. Uh, and I'd love to move into mapping the different, you know, potential outcomes from this hypothetical scenario to see how uh, great nuclear power rivals would respond, how great nuclear power allies would respond. And um, you know, while some of the questions that, I've, that, 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 that I have selected may eventually not be explored given the flow of the interview, um, I hope to flesh out this topic enough to, to, to make it a, a, a useful exercise and hopefully um, worth listening to for everybody, um, for everybody at home. Uh, so uh, to introduce the topic, um, you know, the American research into the atomic bomb began in response to an urgent alarm from Albert Einstein. Um, you know, in which he was uh, speaking about how the Nazis were seeking to develop an atomic bomb themselves and how he urged the Americans to do so as well. Um, this letter from Einstein had prompted uh, President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt to establish a civilian and military committee to investigate uranium and its possible applications. Uh, the establishment of the committee and its work led to the Manhattan Project that everybody knows as being the source of the, um, source of the, of the atomic bomb. Uh, and and this, this, this secret project, while it's you know, usually talked about as being American-led, it actually had uh, British and Canadian participation as well. Um, so the work of the Manhattan Project culminated in the creation of the first atomic bomb uh, in, the, in the world uh, in July of 1945. And um, after its creation, uh, the Manhattan Project had uh, you know, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer morosely mused that now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Um, the implication of uh, Oppenheimer's grim words became reality less than a month later as the Americans used their atomic bomb on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing an estimated 225,000 people. Given their role as the first nation to develop the atomic bomb, it's hardly surprising that Americans firmly placed themselves at the center of the uh, non-proliferation regime that they sought to create. Um, though the, 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 the American presence in this regime, while I've done, has, has obviously been... Um, negative, I think it is fair to say, uh, especially given the fact that they're the only nation that has uh, committed the sin of using this atrocious weapon. Uh, there are a few positive uh, impacts that, 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 that American leadership has had on the non-proliferation regime. Um, for example, uh, you know, uh, American President Dwight Eisenhower in 1953 unveiled his Atoms for Peace initiative uh, uh, to the United Nations um, General Assembly. And uh, this this Adams for Peace initiative eventually led to the creation of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, uh, which you know activities began in 1958. Um, though the, IE, the IAEA's um, scope of activities has expanded dramatically since the uh, since since the development of the NPT. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so following the creation of the IAE, IAEA, the United States and other leading nuclear nations sought to create an international treaty aimed at you know, ensuring the non-proliferation of these destructive weapons while also enshrining their own use to, to, to own these weapons for, for prominent nuclear weapon states. Um, and you know, this process resulted in the creation of the you know, 1968 Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons or you know, the NPT uh, as, as, as it is known. Um, in this foundational treaty established a two-tiered regime regarding the development and possession of nuclear weapons. Uh, in this regime, states that had created and tested a nuclear weapon prior to January 1st, 1967, were entitled to continue their possession of these weapons, while all other states that were members of the treaty were formally barred from obtaining these um, atrocious weapons. Um, However, the nations that uh, were entitled to possess these weapons had to commit uh, to progress towards the reduction uh, and eventual elimination of their nuclear arsenals, which is known as Article 6 of the NPT. Um, though this, this, this commitment was aspirational because these states didn't want to bind themselves to, uh, 
to removing their nuclear weapons uh, if they still believe that um, possessing them was in their uh, you know, national security interests. Um, so the nuclear weapon states identified in the treaty are the United States, the Soviet Union, France, the United Kingdom, and China, who are coincidentally the five uh, members of the, the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council as well. Um, the NPT currently has 191 signatory nations with Pakistan, India, North Korea, Israel, and South Sudan as the only nations in the world who have not signed. Um, South Sudan generally gets a pass because they, uh, their reason for not signing is just that they are the, the, the newest nation globally. And um, I, I think it's understandable that they have not um, exceeded yet. But um, all of the other nations have, uh, that have their own reasons, largely due to their um, own I guess internationally illicit uh, uh, nuclear weapons programs um, with India going so far as to call the NPT uh, an, an apartheid regime of uh, nuclear weapons. Um, and and uh, obviously North Korea's, uh, North Korea's nuclear program is well documented. Um, Israel refuses to acknowledge it, but uh, it's, it's well known that they have nuclear weapons as well. Um, Pakistan obviously developed these weapons in response to India's development of, of, of nuclear weapons, given the, 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 the rivalry, uh, longstanding rivalry between these two nations. And um, moving on, uh, you know, as, 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 as an outspoken supporter of the, of the NPT at the time of its creation, um, it's not really surprising that the United States was an advocate for the indefinite extension in 1995. Um, though, you know, this, this, while nobody was, was advocating for, for, for the dismantling of the NPT, um, this, Agreement for indefinite extension was something that was not 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 in, not in the you know not a foregone conclusion. These uh they, there were you know constant you know there were there were many other options that could have could have been the outcome of this meeting. But um you know the, the United States used its its central role in the nonproliferation regime and in global politics, sort of this this unipolar moment that they enjoyed uh, at that in in 1995 after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, to to influence other nations to uh, eventually get them to uh, agree to to this indefinite extension without a vote. Um, so in the years since the NPT's creation, nuclear proliferation for military purposes has largely subsided, with you know some exceptions, unfortunately. Um, and and though concerns about the NPT and its fairness, uh, those those have continued to continued to proliferate widely, um, reasonably so. Uh, you know, there was substantial progress made throughout the 80s and 90s uh, regarding the commitment of um, nuclear weapon states to, to disarm. Um, but unfortunately, um, recent developments such as, you know, the efforts of these states to modernize their nuclear arsenals and um, escalating tensions between great power rivals has, has stalled this progress and, and, and it has allowed for there to be you know, very little progress in this field over the course of the last decade or so. Um, you know, while this history that I've just provided isn't comprehensive, I thought that you know, pro providing a short history of the United States uh, and and its role in the in the nonproliferation regime would would provide some background to everybody listening. Um, if if anybody was um unfamiliar with that history uh, leading up to this point, um, so again, uh, while I will delve into into the topic, uh, the 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 hypothetical scenario um of this of this uh, podcast with Dr. Walker and in my interview section with him, um, I'd like to provide a succinct exploration here as well um, to uh, make sure that I have um, hopefully explored the areas uh, that, 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 that I'm seeking to do uh, throughout this, um, seeking to do throughout this podcast. Um, so in, in this hypothetical scenario that was outlined earlier, we envision a United States that has experienced a revitalization of public interest in nuclear disarmament, um, akin to that seen throughout the 1980s and 1990s, um, this resurgent public interest results in the election of an idealist congressional rep of idealist congressional representatives and a president with a genuine desire to reach global zero. Seeking to reach this goal, a law is passed through both houses of Congress and signed into law by the president, which mandates the complete elimination of the American nuclear arsenal by 2025. Working towards achieving this goal begins almost instantaneously, with drastic reductions in nuclear arms taking place immediately. These reductions are seen by the entire world and the American commitment to complete disarmament is understood to be a genuine effort on behalf of the United States to reach global zero. While this effort is genuine, complete disarmament will not be achieved overnight and the latent nuclear knowledge needed to develop weapons of mass destruction will remain. Blatantly aggressive actions by other nations could stop this process of disarmament despite the desire of the United States to reach global zero. So in this hypothetical scenario, we're gonna focus on the reactions of many of the important states or really groups of states throughout the world um, so what we're going to focus on, we're, there are hypothetical scenarios like this could always unfold in a myriad of ways. And, and, and 
obviously the impact of uh, if, if you're saying, you know, what would what would Russia's response be? Russia's response would obviously be influenced by China's response, which would be influenced by the UK's response and France's response. And there, there, there are countless different factors where these hypotheticals could truly never end if you want to um, flesh them out to that extent. I want to just focus on what I believe to be the most likely scenarios and trying to map out what, what, what those would be. Um, so uh, moving on to, to the groups that will be that the, 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 the groups that will be you know, observed in terms of uh, talking about how the response could be. Uh, the first, it will be um, nuclear power rivals, um, which, which, which you know, is states such as, such as China and Russia. Uh, there are nuclear power allies, states such as the United Kingdom and France. Um, there are nuclear states outside of the NPT, excluding North Korea, uh, meaning Israel, Pakistan, India. Um, there are states, there, uh, uh, there's North Korea's response as well. Um, there are states protected by the American nuclear umbrella, you know, such as South Korea specifically. Um, and then there are non-nuclear weapon states globally outside of existing nuclear umbrellas. Um, so focusing first on America's prominent nuclear rivals, Russia and China, uh, we explored that what their possible responses to this hypothetical American disarmament could be. So um, the first scenario that I've mapped out would be um, at first skeptical of the American commitment to disarmament, Russia and China soon observe the material reduction in nuclear arms and come to see the American commitment to complete nuclear disarmament as genuine. Seeing this as perhaps the only viable chance to reach global zero, Russia and China announced that they will begin a process of disarmament similar to that pursued by the Americans. While this scenario is clearly rather idealistic, there's a chance that there could be a, a, a push in these nations, maybe a desire within the public to take advantage of this, of, the, of this hypothetical chance to actually reach global zero, which is something that I think uh, many of us, including myself, see as, as, see as, see as rather unfeasible uh, right now in, in, in given, given the state of the world at present. So if, if, if these publics were presented with the opportunity to actually pursue this goal, um, I, I, I think there, there's a non-zero chance that they could um, rally in support of it. Um, though uh, the, the, the second scenario of uh, great power uh, rival, nuclear power rivals in response to this US commitment to disarmament would be that um, they seek to capitalize on the reduction in nuclear arms in the United States. Um, Russia, given the in, in current geopolitical scenario, uh, they, they, they decide to, they elect to invade Ukraine, given that they no longer have the um, deterrent of, a, of nuclear response from the United States, not given other nations could respond. Um, and and uh, China advances into the South China Sea and seeks to, they both seek to advance their um, territorial interests uh, without this uh, threat of deterrent from the United States is, is, is another way that this scenario could play out. Um, for for great power allies, uh, this this scenario could the scenario could unfold with um, a scenario could unfold with the UK and, and France seeing this American commitment to, to disarmament. And you know the first scenario would be that they similar to what the process I just described earlier in uh, great power rivals. There, the publics of these nations see this opportunity to eliminate one of the most perhaps the most the single greatest danger to to humanity and uh, rally in support of this. But um, I, I think there's a very plausible and perhaps more likely second scenario in which these nations see this 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 as a um, America stepping down from 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 nuclear leadership and 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 the UK and France could see this as an opportunity to assert themselves on the global stage um, while while still certainly incredibly powerful and prominent nations globally I think it can be agreed that the UK and France are are not quite held in the same international esteem as on. Um, as Russia and China and the United States as these great superpowers. So it's possible that the United Kingdom and France could see this, op see this as an opportunity to assert themselves and, and, and to place themselves among the world's superpowers. Um, now, as far as for nuclear states outside of the NPT, excluding North Korea, um, India and Pakistan, I believe, would uh, unfortunately largely maintain their nuclear arsenals, even in response to this American commitment to disarmament, because they're um, the presence of the nuclear arsenals is, has, has much more to do with the great power rivalry between the two of them than it does anything else. Um, now to provide an idealistic scenario, um, I, it, it's, it's not impossible that these nations could view this, uh, could view this commitment from disarmament to Americans in the same way that I'm describing in other nations, that uh, they view it as an opportunity and uh, they begun a bilateral uh, arms reduction process between the two of them, which I think would have to be the form it would take given, again, the great power rivalry that I just spoke about a moment ago. Um, and for Israel, I, I believe that Israel would likely view this as uh, them losing, uh, the, or one of their, their most important ally losing some of their uh, 
international power and esteem, and they would likely strengthen their own nuclear weapons program. Um, though, again, the, the same idealistic process I've described in other nations could take place in Israel. Though, realistically, I believe they would, um, they would respond by strengthening themselves uh, and their nuclear arsenal. Um, so for the North Korean response, um, I personally believe that, uh, well, North Korea has been calling for a long time for the uh, for, for Americans to reduce their own nuclear arms um, in responses to calls to stop the, uh, nuclear, the um, North Korean nuclear program. Um, I believe that, uh, I believe that, I believe that uh, Kim Jong-un and North Korean leadership would see this as an opportunity to, um, to assert themselves uh, on the global stage. Um, though, <clears throat> So it is it is possible that, that that they could see this as their one opportunity to um, remove perhaps the single greatest nuclear threat to them. Um, now, uh, to move to states protected by the American nuclear umbrella and really just focusing on South Korea more than anything because of, uh, of their situation, um, I believe theirs would obviously be tied to the North Korean response. Um, I, I think South Korea would, if if the North Koreans. Um, uh, agreed to start to 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 uh, dismantle their nuclear program in response to this American disarmament. Um, then I think South Korea would support the United States and and on the global stage. However, if uh, North Korea did not, um, if North Korea did not agree to uh, start to uh, dismantle their nuclear programs, I believe that South Korea would develop their own nuclear weapons in response uh, to 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 try to ensure their own safety, given uh, the proximity of the North Korea of the North Korean um, nuclear threat. Um, and for uh, non-nuclear weapon states, globally outside of existing nuclear umbrellas, I think the only feasible response that I could see would be would be overwhelming joy and um, encouragement and 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 pressure placed on other nations to do the same. Um, because I mean, these weapon the, these uh, these nations have long criticized the um, nuclear weapon states for not fulfilling their obligations in Article Six and not truly, you know, genuinely in good faith pursuing disarmament. And um, I believe that. Uh, I believe that if this were to take place, then these nations would be, you know, absolutely thrilled because this this would represent, a, you know, a, a fulfillment of that commitment. And uh, I, I I believe that this is uh, that this this would be cause for celebration, cause for support among um, non non nuclear weapon states that are outside of existing nuclear umbrellas. Um, now I have uh, I have my doctor with William uh, my interview with Dr. William Walker coming up immediately after this, but I hope this solo. Uh, the solo portion of the podcast has provided um, listeners with a little bit of background on the American role in the existing non-proliferation regime, and with enough background on the um, hypothetical scenario to see uh, to see and understand the ways in which um, Dr. William Walker may um, may believe that it could play out. So um, I thank you for listening, and I hope that you enjoy my interview with Dr. Walker. All right. Um, I, I need to hit the bus on the saying continue. Do I? Yes, you do. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, so I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. William Walker from the University of St. Andrews in St. Andrews, Scotland. Uh, Dr. Walker is an accomplished scholar in the fields of international politics and nuclear weaponry. Um, now, before we shift our focus to the primary topic of discussion, uh, I'd like to ask you, how did you come to be an expert in the field of you know, nuclear weapons and international politics? What led you down that path? I think it happened by chance. I mean, I... I, I um... I've had an unusual career in that my first degree was in engineering and I worked in industry for a while, but that didn't last. And I went back into the university system to do a master's like you're doing at the moment. And then when I was at Sussex University in England, I was recruited and joined a, a research institute, which was focusing on issues of technological change. And while there I became involved in energy studies and that led to nuclear studies. So in a way, I began um, with looking at um, the nuclear industry and how it was structured uh, internationally, what its dynamics were. And this was a time when there was a great expectation for nuclear energy, uh, but also accidents were happening. And so there were many questions about it. And then that drifted into uh, issues to do with nuclear proliferation. Uh, particularly arising from the diffusion of nuclear power technologies. And then that led into the broader questions about international nuclear relations. And then I moved to St. Andrews and I had to teach the subject. Mm -hmm. And one of the consequences of teaching the subject, and you may appreciate this, is extremely difficult to give a kind of broad overview of this subject. It's so enormous and diverse. Mm -hmm. And so that led me into actually thinking about 
issues do with international nuclear order and how to frame the whole thing theoretically. And that became a preoccupation. At the same time, I did all sorts of other things, um, not necessarily linked to nuclear power. And um, anyway, I now, uh, I'm still quite active. I still write and I still engage a bit, but I am actually retired formally from my university. Okay. And so I, I feel at the moment I'm a kind of old fogey, <laughs> well, looking from a bit of a distance at what goes on. I can't read as much as I used to. I mean, I just don't have access to it. Right. I don't frankly have the great energy to read all this stuff coming up, particularly out of the United States. And so I perhaps I, I feel uh, I'm still in a position, I think, to, to have an overview on the whole thing. And actually, I, if I have a criticism of many studies in this field, they become too specialized. Mm -hmm. They don't see the big picture and they don't know really how to think about the big picture. Mm -hmm. And so there's all sorts of drives to specialize, which I, I understand and is some of it's necessary, but I resist a bit. <laughs> well, that makes sense. I think that's definitely something I've noticed uh, as moving through academia yeah. is uh, you, you, you do have to specialize to such an almost extreme degree because you, you're taught yeah. that, that it has to be original work when you're contributing. And it, it definitely um, can result in people missing the forest for the trees, I would think. And I'm afraid that PhDs, uh, doctoral research, drives that partly. I, I because agree. It requires specialization and it also drives you towards being extremely methodological or requiring a very scientific in quotes approach which sometimes i think traps you you've got to be careful uh, my little um, advice to you is be careful not to be trapped i don't know what you're going to do for your phd but be careful <laughs> I, no, no, I appreciate that yeah no and I, 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 i'd be happy to talk about it um no but i am um, i i find myself thinking a lot of the same things i've personally opted mm -hmm. uh for uh in the programs i've been looking at um <clears throat> focusing more so on uh, qualitative methodology, more so than quantitative. Don't get me wrong, I'm open to the quantitative methods. I know they're an important part of the yeah. field and, and, and they're necessary for, um, for, for, for making you know, uh, definitive assertions usually, but I, I find that much more valuable insight can be found through qualitative methodology and that's personally what I prefer. Um, but so I just had, uh, <clears throat> I had one question come to mind as you were speaking through yeah. all of that. I just wanted to ask at, at, at a very basic level, which, which, which part of the debate, do you find yourself aligning more with, um, with, with, with Waltz's idea of uh, his article of um, his uh, more may be better or, uh, or, or Scott Sagan's uh, more will be worse? I just, just at a very basic level, do you, do you think that wider proliferation of nuclear weapons is something that could contribute to international peace or is it just a, a threat to the international order? And yeah, is, is, which one do you, what, what do you see it as? I, I think I, I would definitely come down on more will be worse. But of course, it depends what you mean by more. Um, <laughs> I you guess have to qualify well, guess... that a bit. And uh, sometimes the reaction to, to the more is also as bad as the actual. <laughs> I mean, I think one thing we can talk about is the United States in its reaction to this problem has sometimes made it worse, or at least has created a lot of other problems in the world um, that are derived from being too zealous or, or applying the, the, uh, an approach that um, well caused a certain amount of uh, people and decay in the main institutions and so on. I, but I don't, I don't know if you want to go into that, but I think it's non-proliferation policy uh, is not necessarily, um, at least it depends how it's practiced as to what benefits arise from it. And sometimes uh, the way in which it is practiced are very deleterious. Um, yeah. Not always, of course. And um, my, I suppose the issue that concerns me most is the relationships between the states that have nuclear weapons. That is the, that is the dominant problem in the world. And actually, it's always been that. And um, the nuclear proliferation, of course, is a serious issue. But it is dwarfed by the problems of the relationships between those who are using nuclear weapons to threaten one another. And where... I mean, this is another subject, perhaps. I think the whole uh, institution of arms control and even the ability to control these relationships and to achieve strategic stability, et cetera, et cetera, is diminishing. 
Yeah, that makes partly sense. because intri intrinsically it's becoming more difficult. Right. Um, uh, so I think personally, I think uh, of course nuclear proliferation is a very very serious issue. Um, but my preoccupation will be with those that actually possess the things and how they behave. And that makes sense. Um, and I, I definitely, yeah, the, yeah. This is uh, obviously the, the, as as we talked about before. Yeah, I want to talk about the the hypothetical a little bit, but um. The, uh, the, uh, the, the role of the United States in the existing non-proliferation regime is definitely something I'd like to like to discuss. That's a central uh, part of this. And I um, this kind of brings me to the question I wanted to ask. Uh, so you're talking about the, the behaviors between um, nuclear weapon states, and uh, that it just brings to mind. I remember um, President Clinton's initiative uh, in, in, in the in towards the latter half of his uh, presidential tenure to um, research and potentially create a, a, a ballistic missiles defense system was uh, that was yeah. something that he was looking into. Do you think that if the United States had never announced they were potentially looking into, which obviously it didn't turn out to be feasible, so they're, they're not doing it, but um, do you think that, that, that President Clinton announcing that the U.S. was looking into that, did, did, did that itself uh, destabilize the regime? Because I know that, that that obviously could have, if it had been successful, would have uh, completely you know, completely reformed how the, how the international nuclear order is based on this, you know, second strike capabilities. I think I'll correct you a bit. And I don't think it came from Clinton. Um, the whole pressure to have a, uh, to develop this technology. I mean, of course it began, the idea goes back quite a long way, mm. but it really was expressed uh, vehemently by President Reagan with his gotcha. strategic defense initiative. And then it was taken up by people in Congress, and uh, particularly by people like Rumsfeld and the Rumsfeld Commission. Right. And so really they drove um, from within Congress, the, the, um, they drove the presidency, I think, in, into to some degree um, accepting that there would be this project and they would commit funds to it, when in fact no one knew whether it would work. Right. And hadn't really thought through its consequences. And I think at the time in the mid 90s, if we're talking here about the mid to late 90s, there was this was the kind of period of America's hegemonic moment. And they didn't really believe that the Russians or Chinese, for that matter, um, could react in a significant way to this initiative. And so they felt that they had a certain amount of freedom to pursue this technology uh, without really serious consequences. And likewise, they felt they had freedom to eventually uh, discard the ABM treaty without serious consequences. Mm -hmm. And my memory is that Clinton actually tried to constrain this, but he found that he couldn't. And so I don't know if you've come across yet um, Michael Crapon's book about the history of arms control, which was published this year. Uh, which is very good, I mean, with some caveats, but it's very, very good. But I think he, he regards the second Clinton administration coinciding with Yeltsin being in the, in, in the Kremlin right. as being a period of great lost opportunity and the beginning of the slide, you might say. But I think that it, it also was the beginning of that, you know all about it yourself, I'm sure, of the problems in Congress and in the Senate and this adversarial politics when you couldn't actually ratify anything and whether certain factions within particularly within the republican party seem to be determined to push through things come what may and that to me has become an enormous problem of course yeah. in all sorts of respects but it has actually it is actually damaging the international nuclear order part of the reason being that no one uh really can expect that the United States, whatever it's proposing, will actually ratify it and put it into place. Because, you you know, there's been oscillation between um, residencies, whether they support international institutions or don't. And so um, from that point of view, the United States is, we're going perhaps on a tangent here, but the United States is losing authority within not just this international um, arrangement and a certain loss of trust in its ability to deliver what it's actually proposing. Absolutely. And I think that leaks into the whole uh, approach to non-proliferation too. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I, would, I would definitely agree. And I, I you can yeah, see, that... 
Sorry. You can see it today actually over Iran, over the JCPOA. Right. Why should the Iranians actually believe that the Americans are going to stick to whatever they commit themselves to at the moment? Exactly. If, very tough. if the Republicans win in 2024, whoever the Republican president would be would just withdraw from it immediately. It's yeah, it's 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 there there really has been a, a surge of um a surge of nationalism especially in the conservative elements of american politics yeah. that has has unfortunately really hindered any sort of you know multilateral efforts to to address not not only nuclear not only nuclear issues with the iran deal but obviously we've seen it with the paris climate accords as well um it's it's something that has unfortunately it, it seems malignant in its form and then in terms of this destruction of any sort of real international progress made by american administrations at this point unfortunately yeah, I, I've thrown another thing here that um, which perhaps doesn't get enough attention, but the uh, from almost uh, early Clinton, even Reagan onwards, up to I think into Obama, there was a kind of um, uh, foundation of American international policy to some degree was the ideas of promoting globalization and democratization. That in a way that one of the ways of dealing with the problem of nuclear proliferation is by removing the incentives to acquire nuclear weapons and democratic peace theory implied that you know if everyone became democratic they would be peaceful forever after and they wouldn't be seeking nuclear weapons and also that globalization would increase interdependence and thus give again make people sort of bound to a rule-based order and uh, a more governable um, situation. And through this combination, you would actually arrive in due course at a more peaceful world. And of course, it, it didn't turn out like that. And in fact, promoting democratization turned out to, to some degree in the Middle East, for instance, to being um, a bit of a disaster and having the total opposite effect. Yeah, to say the least. And, but I think that the, we're now retreating, of course, in both respects, in that autocracy is on the rise and globalization is to some extent being pulled apart again. Mm -hmm. And so we're not we're entering a situation where, in fact, the, the world is more fragmented mm -hmm. and we, where you have new fault lines in the international system between the, the kind of autocratic authoritarian world and the democratic world. But the democratic world is going through a period of... Um, uncertainty and feeling unsure of itself I mean, you're, yeah, feeling you're, fragile you're absolutely you know? you're absolutely right i think i think fragile is the uh, is is certainly from from my experiences in the uni in the united states currently that's the or yeah but recently that's definitely how i would characterize our at well, least it's true in you it's true in europe too it's not just in the united states it's also right. in europe right. in my own country you know for instance right you, yeah. we, we all are all affected by these trends you know we yeah. are um, um so I think, but I was thinking is when you, when you, um, if you take the long view in this, um, I've been thinking about how on earth to talk about this because it's a very complicated subject. Um, if you go, you know, it's now how many decades is it since the beginning of the nuclear age? It's uh, seven or eight, it's coming up to eight, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, from the very outset, that's over 70 or 80 years, the United States has been very consistent in wishing to curtail nuclear proliferation and has regarded itself through most of that period as being the central state in trying to organize that non-proliferation. And um, also feeling it has a special responsibility. I think having originally, it began there. It began its period of hegemonic extension, you might say. Uh, when nuclear weapons came on the scene. And then it formed a kind of, uh, there was a dual hegemony in a way that the, the, the non-proliferation regime really emerged out of, a bit more than this, it emerged out of a cooperation between the Soviet Union and the United States. And so they jointly managed this sphere and they jointly brought the non-proliferation treaty into being. And they jointly tried to Actually, within their own domains, they managed nuclear trade, but they cooperated on that. And they, on the whole, didn't get in each other's ways when it came to non-proliferation. They worked together, unlike in their 
wider strategic relationships. And then um, they were very successful in many ways. And uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty came into being. And then by the mid 90s, nearly everyone belonged to it. And it looked quite a, quite a good position. Absolutely. And then I suppose the, 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 the Russians fell out of this. They no longer had the resources or the ability to play much of a part in it, right. except in relation to governing their own domain, which was problematic to begin with. Um, and then, of course, they began challenging the Americans again. Right. And in the meantime, the United States had gone through this period of, as I mentioned, this hegemonic moment, of trying to assert itself, not through the regimes, but through um, uh, a more muscular and almost militarized approach to the subject. And of course, the 9-11 played a part in that. And so you had the emergence of counter-proliferation, which is... Um, really a, a national approach to the whole thing and one in which uh, coercive measures uh, become more prominent mm -hmm. and to some degree we haven't quite recovered from that i would say in that it's still um the institutions of non-proliferation have to some extent wilted and given way certainly in american thinking to those of counter-proliferation and in this country, for instance, in the Foreign Office here, which led on non-proliferation, they abandoned the phrase non-proliferation when President Bush came into office right. and substituted counter-proliferation mm. and uh, went along with the Americans. And of course, the, the Iraq war was part of that in mm. 2003. So, um, and then the whole disarmament movement takes shape in the late, late in sort of two, around about 2010 the initiative and leading to the TPNW and so in a way within the non-proliferation community or the international communities this, you now have this breach between those who civil society and some states which really want to focus they've had enough they want to focus purely on disarmament right. and there's a kickback from the nuclear powers saying this is not the real world yeah. Um, we want to carry on as before, essentially. And so you have this um, uh, schism, you might say, uh, internationally, with certain states like Germany and so on, the, the, um, those who are, are protected by extended deterrence being somewhere in the middle in this. Right. You have a schism which is actually um, rather damaging, I would say, to the NPT and uh, creating a bad climate in relation to the general global order and uh, a loss of faith and trust i think in the uh, in those who are actually proclaiming its great significance and so on and so forth and so we're not really in a very good position and of course arms control itself between the russians and the americans between the pakistanis and the indians between the chinese and everyone else is really going nowhere at the moment okay. And so the whole international situation is is difficult. Now, despite all that, I think if you look out in the world uh, from today, it's surprising how few states are interested in having nuclear weapons. And so it's not just that the norm of non-proliferation has actually taken root. Of course, there are exceptions and there are regions where one worries. But in, in a way, nuclear weapons are no longer, I would say, at the frontier of strategic development and strategic relations. Right. It's an old technology. It's a familiar technology. And where states are really putting their resources and where they're really worrying is in things like cyber, right. space technology, all these other technologies which have an effect on the nuclear domain. But that's where the, the really big changes are happening. And a whole lot of new strategic games are emerging that are being practiced, hybrid warfare, all sorts of ways of managing relations and threatening others and, as I say, playing games, are emerging that don't really fundamentally stem from nuclear technology. Right. And so, so the situation internationally, I think, is nuclear weapons are still terribly important. 
and to some extent some regard them as even more important than they've ever been but you have to see it, I think, in the wider context, strategic context of a whole new raft of technologies coming along, which actually complicate the picture and means that if you're a, a, an aspiring state or one feeling a bit uh, um, defenseless or whatever, where are you going to put your money? Where are you going to put your resources? And I, suggest, I would suggest you actually nuclear weapons may be there, but in fact, you're going to think twice about that and think, well, actually what I really should be investing in is drones and cyber and all these other things, because that's where the, that's the new world strategically. Right. I don't know if you agree with that. So I think you have this curious situation where the arms control non-proliferation system is in deep trouble. And of course, one worries greatly about nuclear wars breaking out by accident or design. But at the same time, that's not where the, that's not really the central preoccupation of the great powers right. and of middle powers and even lesser powers. That's well, not the great preoccupation. Yeah, I think you can see with um, what's just happened in Ukraine. I believe it was, it was either this morning or yesterday with, 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 with the nationwide cyber attack that's taken place where, where they're, at least that, the, the, those that have hacked have, have claimed that they have all of the personal information of all Ukrainian nationals, which we'll see if that's the case. I think it's still unfolding, yeah. but I, I think yeah. you're absolutely right. And I, yeah, I agree with you 100% that that does appear to be where, you know, it, it looks like that's going to be the realm in which new new wars are, are are contested. I think that's where great powers will, and in like you said, middling and even rising powers may may attempt to may attempt to 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 show their prowess moving forward. But um, and I, I definitely agree. But uh, on on the top of what you were talking about, um, I wanted to ask. So you talk about how it is uh, there. It seems like in terms of multilateralism internationally for uh for for nuclear nonproliferation, it does seem we're in an incredibly difficult spot. Um, and I do wonder, do you first, do you think the NPT, even though I know it was indefinitely extended, do you think we're going to see any defections from it moving forward? Or do you think that, I know with the TPNW just entering into force, and I think it was January of 2021, but there's no nuclear weapon states, do you think there's any chance that the, I mean, I think that the basis of the nuclear order could shift, that, 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 it, that the NPT could lose its somewhat prestigious status as the basis of it? Well, I think I think to some extent it has lost that to some extent, but I don't think you're going to see many defections. I mean, there may be one or two. I mean, Iran, it's possible, will right. defect. Uh, North Korea already has, but I don't see that happening because ultimately, I think most states regard it as in their best interest to keep going. Yeah, but there's something. Uh, a friend of mine was saying just um, a few weeks ago when I spoke to him, we were talking about the conference coming up, and he was talk He he said it's actually a ritual, this NPT conference. Right. But it's that in international politics you need rituals, even though people give these rather vacuous speeches and everyone gets very bored and it goes on and on and on, you don't necessarily end up with a final document or whatever. Right. You still need these kinds of rituals in which states come together and talk and talk to each other. And uh, to leave that and to discard that would be seen, I think, as, as something retrograde. And in a way, I think there's always the hope that you'll be able to pick up on it again and make real use of it. And another point is, I think that the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is valued, uh, in a way is is bound up with the NPT. And if you if you allow the NPT to deteriorate uh, too much, it's going to lead really to the deterioration of the IAEA itself and its status. It's also the NPT is linked in a way to test ban treaties. So the, these things are, are connected together in some ways into this, this regime, as I say. And my impression is that overall, states don't want to give up on this. Right. And so they hang on to it. Hang on to what you have, um, hoping for probably better days. But at the same time, I mean, one thing that... Uh, I would observe is that this is an old treaty now. 
and it was negotiated in the mid 1960s. Right. It's been reinterpreted in many ways. Right. There have been new interpretations, new commitments, but they're not legal necessarily. Um, and to some extent, it's archaic. And but it's always been I've always been told ever since I began this business back in the late 70s, I've been told that the NPT is unamendable. You can't amend the NPT. And that may be true, but that is problematic. Right. If you can't amend the treaty. I mean, the way in which it's the non proliferation reach is developed really is by you have this central text and then you add things to it. Uh, other treaties, other agreements get sort of attached to it in some ways, sometimes loosely, somewhat, sometimes very tightly. But the central text itself stands uh, and gets a bit reinterpreted, but nevertheless, it creaks. Right. And the definitions in it creak. And sometimes the interpretation is tricky. I mean, if you take Article 6, who really wants to live with that language? Um, and I sometimes have thought myself, if I was starting again to um, draft this kind of treaty now, where would you start? And are we sensible, in fact, in refusing to even look at that? You know, we have the TPNW, but we still have the MPT, but there's nothing somehow in between to work with. And um, I think that my what's been running through my head is why don't you start with a preamble? And if you were um, writing a preamble to an MPT like treaty now, what would it look like? And I think that's quite an interesting exercise, actually. The only thing is you immediately come up against that you can't really imagine states acceding or agreeing to a treaty with this name. Right. It would have to be a non-proliferation and disarmament treaty. But then the the ghost at the table has always been, the ghost in the room has always been deterrence. Right. And right. one of the curiosities, again, about people call this a cornerstone of international security, is you can't mention nuclear deterrence. Mm -hmm. You're discussing the MPT. <clears throat> Because to talk up nuclear deterrence is actually undermines the whole uh, non-proliferation norm. It's always been a fundamental problem. This and even <clears throat> I used there's a very well-known guy called Michael Quinlan in the United Kingdom, who was the kind of uh, in charge of nuclear policy in the Ministry of Defence for years and years and years, and a very eminent man, a very nice man actually. I knew him rather well, and he was a very committed. Uh, Sorry if I'm diverging here, but he was a very committed Catholic and he believed very strongly that any policy, including deterrence, had to have a moral basis. And so he he was very engaged in his working life, but also after he retired in the early 90s, in trying to persuade people of the moral case for nuclear weapons and deterrence. Um, and he was quite successful, I have to say, and he wrote very interesting books. But what he couldn't really come to terms with was the idea that, in fact, non-proliferation, if you apply his ethical logic, non-proliferation is unethical. Yeah. Because you're denying to countries the right to defend themselves. And you're abrogating, arrogating to yourself the right to defend yourself from nuclear weapons and to proclaim that they're essential. But you're denying that right and that kind of logic to everyone else. And from a certain point of view, it suggests that non-proliferation policy is actually unethical, if you apply um, his his logic. I mean, I, I know that India has always referred to the MPT as um, nuclear apartheid. I believe is the is, is the terminology they've used. And I, I mean, I, to to an extent, I think it's hard to it's hard to argue that that this that this isn't uh, that the MPT hasn't you know um, entrenched this two tiered regime that certainly advantages the you know the nuclear weapon states. Mm -hmm. Well, the Indians used that terminology until they acquired them themselves. <laughs> the, the Indians, I have to say, uh, uh, are as hypocritical as anyone in this field. 
<laughs> well, as, as, as an American, I think I don't think I'm 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 allowed to speak on hypocrisy. I think that is our national <laughs> currency, to be honest with you. Um, but okay, all right. Uh, this is this has been incredibly interesting so far, and I just I just uh, I want to touch on the um on the hypothetical before we before this. Yeah. I'm not yeah before the interview ends. I, I think we have 45 minutes on Zoom. I think is what you get before it yeah closes out. So. Uh, I just wanted to, so um, I know I emailed you the hypothetical before, but I just to sort of, I guess, set the scene a little bit. The idea would be that, you know, the United States, it's, it's hard to imagine right now, but let's yeah. just, 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 just for, for okay. the purposes of the exercise yeah. to imagine that the United States elects, uh, elects a president and a Congress that is, that, that, that is firmly committed to disarmament and not just not just in the the grandiose mm -hmm. terms that they like just that you know obama gave that speech in 2009 in prague where he talked about disarmament and then mm -hmm. nothing really happened um mm -hmm. i'm more saying that this is a this is this is a congress and a president that that passes and signs a law that says that the united states will eliminate its entire nuclear arsenal by the year within five to ten years and this 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 is a law that gets passed this is a process that begins immediately not tethered to the actions of any other nations in the world so this is something right. completely independent because i understand that if you get into the minutia of it you could say like well russia's response would obviously affect the american response which would affect the chinese response which would affect everybody's but just for the yeah. interests of the exercise so uh, i wanted to ask first if the united states were to do that uh you know what would what do you believe the, the, the responses of, of the, great, the great nuclear power rivals would be? Let's say China and Russia. Do you think these nations would, um, do you think these nations would see this as an opportunity towards disarmament or, or would they seek to take advantage of, of, of their, of, of their of, you know, military, of, of their military advantage, of their great power advantage that would result? Um. I find it very hard to answer, actually. Um, I, 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 yeah, it's not. It's, I mean, it's, it's there, difficult. There, there, is an there is an argument that, of course, they would disapprove of the United States doing this because it would uh, open up, open them up to criticism for maintaining these things. Right. And it would probably open up, depending on why the Americans did it, it may open up internal debates about whether these things were required and were necessary and whether they could live without them. And my, if you go back to the Reagan-Gorbachev meeting in Reykjavik, you have to remember that there was this great proposal, um, but whether it could have been implemented is a very open question. And certainly in my country, there was a lot of criticism of it and reluctance to go along with it. And within both the United States and Russia, there were big critics of this. And it, there would have been, I think, a blowback to it. Um, but it, I think it's a question of how an American decision would interact with the wider discourse about nuclear weapons, which is not just the strategic discourse about nuclear weapons. And of course, it's both internal and external to states, but also with the, the broader international debate about the legitimacy of nuclear deterrence and the behavior of states. And um, I think that's, that's very interesting to think about. And it's, to set it up as a question, I think, is quite interesting. But um, I think it depends on a whole lot of things. I mean, another question that hangs over everything at the moment um, is what is the, I mean, one of the questions, big questions is how does the climate emergency interact with the, I mean, the existential problems of climate change right. and the ex existential fears linked to it? How do they affect and interact with the existential problem of nuclear weapons? Right. And how does that actually, down the line, change the way in which the threat to actually to demolish part of the world and destroy part of the ecosystem with nuclear weapons? What does it do to the norms and rules and the whole way in which this practice is viewed? I simply don't know the answer to that, but I think it's an interesting question to pose, actually. 
Absolutely. So I think in five or 10 or 15, 20 years time, it's possible that nuclear deterrence will be looked at a bit differently as a consequence of this other crisis. Right. Another thing is that if in the meantime, when the Americans come to do this, if there has been a nuclear war somewhere, and uh, particularly rather than just a kind of a brush fire, just a limited tactical use, if there has been a nuclear war with serious damage and casualties and everything else, then in those circumstances, a sort of unilateral initiative like the Americans, if others aren't immediately prepared to follow, might have more effect. You know, so I think it depends on context and circumstance. But if there is a nuclear war, then I think that at least it'll ignite um, the debate about the the presence of nuclear weapons in the world. That's um, I, I was I was yeah as as you were saying that I I began to think of the um of 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 the Hibakusha in in Japan those yeah those are the survivors of the American nuclear strikes on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and how uh, there's not there's not a single Hibakusha who is advocating for you know the the presence of nuclear weapons in the world. They're they they're, they're all pretty staunchly they, they oppose the presence of these weapons and I. I think, unfortunately, it's a pattern you see repeated throughout not not only with 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 the nuclear um, with with nuclear proliferation, but with countless uh, dangerous. I mean, the right not to. I don't want to delve into different areas, but you know, with, with we talked about the rise of autocracy recently, and um, you know, the the, the rise of uh, the, the rise of. I I don't want to call it fascism, but I think there's a good chance that it's very near that. Uh, that, yeah. that 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 again, we're, we're we're seeing the same thing. That unfortunately, until these until these until these decisions really result in something catastrophic and horrific, people don't understand the, the, the gravity and how you know, detrimental, how horrific these impacts can truly be. And I, I, I unfortunately, I think you're probably right that a move towards total non-proliferation, a, a move towards global zero probably wouldn't take place unless something incredibly catastrophic and horrific happened first. Do, have you ever read the work of Benoit Pelopidas? Do you know of his name? I do not know. Pelopidas, who's French and he works in Paris. He's been writing very interesting things about luck and the role of luck in, um, we can have, a, I could have another huge conversation with you about this. Of course, of but if you accept that we, it's all down to luck, then it fundamentally should change the whole way in which the whole thing is viewed because it's lived on this myth of, in fact, the whole thing being controllable ultimately. Right. But, um, I mean, in, you're absolutely right in terms of the reality of global politics and the state system and everything else. There's tremendous inertia. And I, I wrote something quite recently about entrenchment and the embedding of nuclear weapons. And it's much more deep and more complicated than the disarmament movement um, uh, portrays it, and particularly partly to do with identity. And it's not just you've got a remove a capability from states you've actually got to change their identities right. and work on their identities because the nuclear possession of nuclear weapons becomes so important to their identities if you look at france if you look at britain if you look at india i would say they primarily nuclear weapons that's the function they serve is they give these states a sense of identity in the world i think it was de gaulle that said that the the, the possession of the bomb is essential for the, for the french you know for the rest of the world to see the french as important but for the french to see themselves as important still that's exactly the the bomb. that's yeah. you, you put your finger right yeah that's exactly right and it's well, anyway well well done with your doing doing this work and i i wish you well um,